Picture this, the late 1990s. The skies are ruled by a single, undisputed monarch, the Boeing 747. For decades, the Queen of the Skies held a lucrative monopoly on the world's longest and most crowded routes. But across the Atlantic, a rival was plotting a revolution. Airbus, having successfully challenged Boeing with its smaller jets, saw the jumbo category as the final frontier. They weren't just going to build a competitor, they were going to build a king. This was the genesis of the A380, a generational bet that would redefine the meaning of scale in aviation. Airbus was fueled by forecasts that painted a very specific picture of the future. Air travel was exploding, growing by 14% in 2004 alone. They believed this growth would lead to one massive problem, crippling congestion at the world's biggest airports. Their solution was the A380, a plane designed to solve the slot constraint problem. It could carry more passengers than any other plane, allowing airlines to boost numbers without adding more flights into crowded hubs like London Heathrow or Dubai. The strategy was built on a simple, powerful idea. The future of air travel was a hub-and-spoke model. Passengers would fly from smaller cities into massive central hubs where they would be consolidated onto giant jets for long-haul journeys. The A3080 was the ultimate hub buster, an aircraft purpose-built for this vision. It was a bet that airlines would always prioritize capacity over frequency. Their confidence was built on concrete numbers. In the early 2000s, Airbus projected a demand for over 1,200 very large aircraft in the coming decades. The goal wasn't just to be bigger, it was to be smarter. The entire project was engineered to hit a single, quantifiable target, to deliver an aircraft with 15 to 20 percent lower operating costs per seat than the reigning Boeing 747-400. This wasn't just ambition, it was a calculated gamble, a mathematical assault on Boeing's crown jewel. The A380 was designed to be the physical embodiment of this conviction, a machine so efficient at moving masses of people that no other option would make sense for the world's busiest routes. The A380 wasn't just big, it was a technological statement. It was the world's first full-length twin-deck airliner, a showcase of European engineering. To manage its colossal weight, designers used advanced materials like carbon fiber reinforced polymer in the wings and lightweight aluminum alloys in the fuselage. In total, over 380 patents were filed for its technologies. The marketing promised a new golden age. Early concepts teased onboard duty-free shops, restaurants, and even gyms. The reality was no less revolutionary. Airbus promised the quietest, most spacious cabin in the sky, with wider seats and a smoother ride. It was a promise of a superior passenger experience, one that would later be realized with iconic onboard bars and even fully functional shower spas. The project was officially launched on December 19, 2000, backed by 50 firm orders from prestigious carriers like Emirates and Singapore Airlines. But the path to the skies was not smooth. The plane's immense complexity, particularly the 350 miles of electrical wiring inside each one, led to severe production delays. French and German design teams were using incompatible software, a critical failure that meant wiring built in Germany didn't fit during final assembly in France. The delays pushed the program billions over budget, with the final development cost swelling to an estimated $25 billion, a sum the program would never recoup. Still, on October 25, 2007, the A380 made its commercial debut with Singapore Airlines. It was an immediate, overwhelming hit with the public. The Super Jumbo was finally in the air, a triumph of engineering. But a storm was gathering on the horizon, one that Airbus never saw coming. Here's the first clue. The true challenge to the A380 came not from a rival Jumbo, but from a new class of smaller, hyper-efficient, long-range aircraft, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. And in a cruel twist of irony, Airbus's own A350. These jets were a revolution. They were built primarily from lightweight carbon composite materials, which drastically cut their weight. But their most decisive advantage was under the wings. A new generation of turbofan engines delivered a leap in fuel efficiency that caught the entire industry by surprise. An Airbus sales chief later admitted they were blindsided. Engine makers had suddenly offered engines with 15% better fuel consumption. This single breakthrough was devastating for the four-engine A380. With only two engines to fuel and maintain, coupled with a lighter airframe, these new twin jets offered brutal reductions in fuel burn per trip. They fundamentally rewrote the economics of long-haul flight. This 
This is where the A380's greatest strength, its size, became its greatest weakness. Its four engines and massive weight resulted in punishingly high costs for fuel, maintenance, and airport fees. The business case was balanced on a knife's edge. It was critically dependent on flying with a very high load factor. On a busy route, a full A380 could be incredibly profitable, but a partially empty A380 was an economic catastrophe, burning immense amounts of fuel to fly empty seats. It became an incredibly high-risk asset. Airlines quickly realized they could fly two smaller, more efficient twin jets for the same capacity, but with far more flexibility and much lower financial risk if a flight wasn't full. The decision to use four engines wasn't just an engineering choice, it became a cascading economic liability. It doubled engine-related acquisition and maintenance costs from the start. Then, as the fleet aged, the real nightmare began. A single comprehensive heavy check on the Super Jumbo could consume up to a staggering 60,000 man-hours of labor. Mandated inspections and repairs for issues like wing cracks added further burdens, turning the plane into a constant drain on airline resources. This created a self-reinforcing cycle of higher costs that the new, simpler twin jets simply didn't have. It was a financial hole that just kept getting deeper. Flight after flight, check after check, think the plane was just expensive to fly, it gets worse. The very world it was designed for was vanishing. Here's where it gets even crazier. The superior economics of the 787 and A350 enabled a fundamental shift in airline strategy away from the hub-and-spoke model and towards point-to-point -to -point transit. Airlines were no longer forced to route everyone through a few mega-hubs. They could now fly direct between smaller city pairs like Nashville to London, bypassing the hubs entirely. This was a direct repudiation of the future Airbus had gambled on. The market began to fragment, with passengers and airlines both preferring the convenience of direct flights. The A380, the ultimate hub-to-hub -hub machine, was being relegation to a shrinking niche. Its fate was sealed in many ways by its own sibling. The A350 gave Airbus's own customers a perfect in-house alternative, effectively cannibalizing the A380's remaining market. Then there was the sheer burden of its size. With a wing span of nearly 80 meters, the A380 was a Code F aircraft, a designation that required airports to undertake costly and extensive modifications. Runways and taxiways had to be widened, bridges reinforced, and new gates built with dual jet bridges. The costs were substantial. One report estimated that just 18 American airports would need to spend nearly a billion dollars on these upgrades. This created a vicious cycle. The limited number of compatible airports reduced the A380's network flexibility, which made it a less attractive plane for airlines. This, in turn, discouraged other airports from making the expensive investments, sealing its fate as a niche product. A plane built to solve congestion was now a plane that struggled to find a place to land. A plane passengers loved but airlines hated. It sounds like a paradox, but what if one airline cracked the code? What if one carrier built its entire empire on this gentle giant? Here's what's really happening happening in Dubai. No story of the A380 is complete without Emirates. The Dubai-based carrier operates nearly half of the entire global fleet and has built its world-renowned brand around the Super Jumbo. The success of Emirates is the exception that proves the rule because it highlights the unique conditions needed for the A380 to work. Emirates' entire business model is a massive-scale hub-and-spoke operation, strategically designed to funnel global traffic through its single hub at Dubai International an airport that was itself built to handle a huge A380 fleet. This model generates the consistently high passenger volumes needed to fill the giant jet on dense, long-haul routes. For Emirates, the A380 is more than a plane. It's the physical embodiment of its brand. The onboard bar and showers are powerful marketing tools that create a distinct advantage. It wasn't just the quiet or the space. The A380's cabin was pressurized to a lower altitude than older jets, a subtle feature that significantly reduces fatigue and the effects of jet lag on long-haul journeys. This relentless focus on the passenger is why Emirates' commitment runs so deep. Their brand identity is fused with the A380's promise of a superior experience. It's why, even after production ended, the airline continued to lobby Airbus for a re-engined A380neo, a modernized version that could carry the legend into a new era. For them, the story isn't over. It's a strategic partnership they refuse to let die, declared all but dead during the pandemic when most 
fleets were grounded, the A380 experienced an unexpected comeback. A rapid rebound in travel demand created a sudden capacity shortage, and the A380 became the perfect tool to meet the surge, granting a second lease on life to the fleets of British Airways, Qantas, and Lufthansa. This revival has breathed some life into what was once a non-existent second-hand market, where the first retired A380s were unceremoniously scrapped. A British startup named Global Airlines now plans to launch transatlantic services with an all-A380 fleet. Despite its economic challenges, the A380 remains an overwhelming favorite among the flying public. Passengers consistently seek it out. The reasons are tangible. The cavernous twin-deck cabin provides a genuine sense of space. It's exceptionally quiet, a result of advanced sound insulation. Its immense mass contributes to a remarkably smooth and stable ride, with less perceived turbulence. And above all, it enabled a level of premium product innovation that remains unmatched. The onboard lounges, the first-class shower spas, and ultra-exclusive multi-room suites like Etihad's The Residence set a new benchmark for luxury that defined an era. The story of the Airbus A380 is a powerful lesson. The aircraft was not a failure of engineering, it was a masterpiece. It was a failure of vision. The A380 stands as a brilliant, flawlessly executed answer to a question the market was about to stop asking. Airbus gambled on a single, monolithic future of congested megahubs and lost to a more fragmented, flexible and efficient reality powered by the twin-jet revolution. Yet, its legacy is more nuanced than just commercial failure. The immense investment pioneered technologies in composites and digital design that were directly transferred to the highly successful A350 program. In that sense, the A380 was a necessary, if colossally expensive, stepping stone. So, was this the last dance for an aviation legend, a $25 billion misstep that will never be repeated? Or was it a necessary sacrifice, a stepping stone whose technology paved the way for the future of air travel? Click here to check out another one of our videos.